Minister Louis Farrakhan and Imam W. Dean Muhammad got together at the IS studios for an exclusive interview. Dr. Nazar Kaja, our chairman, conducted this interview. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. This is uh, indeed a historic occasion. I don't believe that uh, we have seen the two of you together on a live TV set. Am I correct? That is correct. So, indeed, this is the uh, opportunity and honor for IIS to, to host both of you. And you have a convention in town, a Unity Conference. Uh, let's go there now. There have, I mean, there have been, for the last several years, attempts to, to reconcile uh, these two uh, groups or brothers of ours. And uh, what has taken it so long? Well, I think, I think progress has been coming all along. Uh, we didn't just uh, meet as brothers and friends yesterday. Uh, I think it's been a period of years that we have been seeing that we can live together and uh, have separate organizations, separate communities, but accept that we belong to the one community, as Minister Farrakhan said, of Islam. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet there was a, a previous attempt in Chicago also not too long ago. I was there also on that occasion. Yeah. Uh, however, after that, uh, uh, we didn't hear anything about it. Well, you know, we are brothers. We are cut from the same cloth. We come from the same family. We have genuine disagreements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those disagreements have never made us hateful and destructive of one another. It is only natural for a family to want to reconcile differences, to come together, to be what we believe Allah would desire. Mm -hmm. This man is one of the great preachers of Islam, not only in America, but anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And God has raised me as well. So why should not we pool our resources mm -hmm. and be one great uh, source of strength for Muslims, not only in America, but throughout the world? And none could do that. The Imam and I have met on several occasions. But Allah, subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala, He mm -hmm. is the one who sets the time. And I would hope. That as you question us about what has taken us so long, we could look back and ask you all the same question. <laughs> Absolutely. What's taking you all so long to iron out your differences? Yeah. Allah will help us if we desire that in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And he and I have desired, mm -hmm. and our communities have desired. Mm -hmm. My son has married into his family, yeah. and we, we are family. So we don't want madness to continue. We want to fight for Islam. Exactly. That's, fair. That's fair enough. And I think your, your question to us is, is a very valid one. Uh, we are still in the process, my answer is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will address that issue hopefully also. Uh, but going back a little bit, I think especially for Minister Farah Khan, uh, the, the idea that over the years has prevailed is that in the belief system that was articulated through Nation of Islam, there was something which was quite different from Orthodox Islam. Would you just shed some light and put this out of the, the way so that we go forward? Uh, let me say that um, I thank Allah so much for the man that came to try to put us on the road to Islam. The starting point is not the finishing point. The starting point is letting us know that we have a journey. Master Farad Muhammad told us to accept our own and to be ourselves. We know that he, a human being born February 26, 1877, is not the originator of the heavens and the earth, but the good that we gained from his three years and four months among us 
was that he raised from among us a man that would get us started mm -hmm. in a process that even though the Islamic world would have liked to have helped us, and many Muslims came to try to help us, they didn't have the right methodology mm -hmm. and approach for the condition that we were in. Farad Muhammad developed a methodology, strange as it seems, unorthodox as it seems, even poisonous as it may seem, yet it was a prescription that started bringing balance to the system and that we would evolve yes. from a nationalistic, black-thinking people into the universal message of Islam. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to dwell on Farad Muhammad, the, the idea that he was the incarnation of, he was God on earth, uh, which is obviously uh, troublesome for, for Orthodox. Of course, uh, of course it was troublesome. <laughs> But the way I see it is that we were taught that Allah came in the person of this human being. Allah says in the Quran, were you angels, I would have sent you one. But you are human beings, so I sent you a human being. In the khutbah of Imam Muhammad yesterday, he talked about this earthly body, but in it was a ruh, the spirit of Allah. Which we all share. Well, yes, we all share it, but we all don't manifest it. And that's why there's so much evil on the earth today. Mm -hmm. We have a chance to manifest the spirit of God, but most human beings are lost from that spirit and are manifesting the spirit of shaitan. Mm -hmm. So we saw God in what this man did to bring us out of the horrible condition that we're in. I would just close that point because I don't think that we should focus on the things which create division because we have more in common than we do have in division. But I want to say this. You know, when, they, when the Muslims were battling, Allah says to the Muslims, it was not you who slew them. It was I who slew them by your hand. So Allah is not absent from us if we receive him. His spirit will come into us, his wisdom will come into us, and we will act on his wisdom. That is the way we see today, mm -hmm. that Allah came in the person of this human being, because nobody did anything for us in the way of Islam other than what Master Farad did and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did and this progression. No, no, I, I, I'm going to end this also as you say that, but by the same token, from the point of view of Orthodox Islam and the belief system, and from the Quranic teaching, which really clearly establishes uh, that God is one and one only. And, uh, and when you come to what you have just articulated, it still leaves us with the idea that Farad Muhammad was indeed God incarnate. Uh, whether this is the methodology or the myth, and a process of transition through which uh, the Afro-American community was coming into Islam, which is fine. Islam is always a work in progress, and things need no, to... Well, let me be very clear. Yes. There is no God but Allah, the Eternal, the Creator, the Originator. We are His creation. And if we submit ourselves entirely to do His will, then we reflect Him. We are looking for, in the Qur'an, the coming of Mahdi, or the coming of Masi. Now, if the Masi, according to the Qur'an, makes the blind see by Allah's permission, makes the deaf hear by Allah's permission, 
raises the dead to life by Allah's permission, who is that functioning? Is it that man functioning? Or is it Allah functioning in and through that man? Who was functioning when Jibreel brought the message to the prophet? Was it Jibreel functioning? Or was it Allah functioning through Jibreel? So you, you may argue that point, but there is only one reality, and that is Allah. And all of us, we either function from his will and his spirit, or we function from the opposition of his will and spirit. Well, uh, the, l l I don't think that anybody will uh, disagree with the latter part of what you said, because it is through Allah that all uh, happens. I mean, Allah is the, the end and the beginning, as the Quran says. Yes. But the difficulty that, uh, uh, that the Muslims have faced uh, when they go to, say, the Nation of Islam website and they see Farad Muhammad uh, is God incarnate, they have difficulty because the idea of unadulterated monotheism is the very root of Islam. If you go to our website and you see point number 12 of what the Muslims believe, it does not say that Farad Muhammad okay. is God incarnate. He said that Allah came in his person, and then it closes saying, and lastly, we believe that there is no God but Allah, and he will establish a government of peace wherein we all can live in peace. Now, that may be unclear, but I leave it there for a reason, because I still think there's a lot that we have to learn of what Master Farad Muhammad taught. I agree with that. But would you, uh, uh, I mean, I thought that even within the differences of opinion that, uh, uh, that have existed, this was one of, the, one, of the, one of the points of division, or am I correct? That this is the main point. The main point that, uh, so, uh, uh, you yeah, know. I differed, I differed with my father. Yes. And I didn't want to differ with him. Yes. In fact, I never differed with him uh, directly. I was t told, he was told that someone heard me saying something different. Mm -hmm. So he called me to question me about it. And I told him that I could more readily believe that he was God than I could believe that his teacher was God because his teacher was a white man and he said white people were devils. And also I told him that I understand something from your teacher that makes me believe that he said those things but he also left enough evidence of his real intent and that was to bring us to the correct idea of God in Islam and for example my mother when I was leaving the home one day after the, uh, my, my father had insisted that I accept God the way uh, he presented God or I was going to be cut off from all communication. He told me he knew it would hurt me to know that I wouldn't be able to see my mother. He said, you won't be able to talk to your mother or see her. So I didn't change. Uh, and as I was leaving, my mother was hurt, and it hurt me to see her hurting like that. She said she walked me to the door, which she didn't do. That was normal for her. Uh, and my father excused you. And she stood on the porch at the door, and she said, Wallace, why don't you go back there? and accept it. Just say you believe. I said, Mama, tell me what Mr. Farad told you all. I said, did he tell you he was God? And she looked like her face went blank and, uh, and looked like she didn't know what to say. And a few seconds she said, no, he did not. Say, in fact, he told us to not even call him prophet. Said that was too big a title for him. Then I said to my mother, how can you ask your son now? to accept a man as God, who told you prophet was too big a title for him. I see. So I think uh, that is the consistent view that, that uh, uh, if, if uh, Master Farad's contribution has been to... Uh, to Farad was sincere, that's my yes, point. Yes, that's what I'm saying. He was very I mean, sincere. Uh, 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 any orthodox Muslim out of the 1.2 billion will, uh, will, will readily accept that. But one, when there is any suggestion of something related to being God on earth, then there is difficulty. You would agree with me? Well, l let me put it to you uh, another way. 
that man, Adam, was to be Allah's vicegerent Khalifa, yes. on earth, Khalifa. What does that mean? That means that Adam was to act on the will of God, in the place of God, by God's command, but not to be worshipped as a God, but to show the human being what the human being could become Correct. if the human being submitted to God. He ordered the angels to bow down to this man that he made and fashioned from, in one part of the Quran, black mud into shape, and from another part, from dust. And he ordered the angels to bow down to Adam. All of this is subject to interpretation. And it is interpretation that gives Muslims these points that create division. And I think now that we in the nation of Islam have accepted Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we recognize when we were taught to pray, every morning our prayer was, surely I have turned myself to thee, O Allah, to him who originated the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. And I am not of the polytheists. That was our prayer. Yes. Our prayer At too. some point, we would come into a greater understanding of that. And I would say that we are like children who don't really know God, but know him through a mom and a dad. But as we mature, we see our mother and our father in perspective. Mm -hmm. And as we mature, we see Master Farad Muhammad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Prophet Muhammad and all the prophets in perspective. Mm -hmm. So oh, may, 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 I, may, mm -hmm. I, may I say something right in connection with what you're saying now? And we have to understand that Mr. Farad did not look outside of religion to put his ideas together. Mm -hmm. He looked at Christianity. He might even looked at the Hinduism. I don't know. Jainism, who knows? But I know he looked mostly at Christianity as given in the Bible, okay? And the Bible says of Christ Jesus, peace be upon him, not that we follow this, but I'm giving this mm -hmm. to show what influence, perhaps influence, uh, Mr. Farad. A master Farad. He was a master psychologist. He knew how to deal with people with problems and help them, okay? So um, he, he, I said, looked at the Bible, too, to see what can he get from the Bible to help a people who are already in the Bible. We were in the Bible. We believed in the Bible in the church. And he found that, that Jesus said, uh, it is said of Jesus, part me, that he took mud and he put on the blind man's eye, and the blind man right away could see mud on his eyes. That's what Farad did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He put mud on our eyes. Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, to, to keep us from seeing what we were seeing before. Correct. And once the mud is washed off, we can see Islam, we can see the Quran, mm -hmm. we can see Muhammad. No, there is uh, no question that the, the, uh, either through, through the, the myth or through the methodology, yes. uh, he, methodology. he was an important p person. And, and no one said, will disagree. He asked the question. Look what Farad did. He treated all of his, all the people who would come in the yes. temple of Islam as students. And he said, "What means and method?" He asked the he asked mm -hmm. the question, "What means and methods must be used mm -hmm. to solve our problems to wake us?" If he asked plus, the question himself. Plus, according to what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us. Master Farad Muhammad gave him 104 books to study. And Elijah Muhammad said to me, the best of those books was the Holy Quran. 
and the other 103 all contained aspects of the life of Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. The only picture we have of Farad Muhammad is his eyes looking into the Quran. The Quran. That's true. Yeah. So what was he teaching us? And last thing on that, I made a tape as a representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I taught something on the history of Jesus as he taught it. And when I came out to the house, he had my tape with red on the back of it. And he said to me, I don't want you teaching what I taught 40 years ago. I want you to teach the meaning of what I taught. Because truth was hidden inside of that, but not necessarily that. Then he said, I'm sick and tired of my ministers quoting the Bible. He said, the Quran is the root of Muhammad, so study the Quran. So to me, Excellent. there was a Excellent. man that was Excellent. moving us in a direction, but he did not want, if I may humbly say this, the old world of Islam to interfere with our coming up. I agree 100% with you. And I asked myself, why? Didn't he want the old world of Islam to interfere with our coming up? Because from a humble heart, he taught us to love Islam. Yeah. To love our world of Islam. Yeah. To respect our world of Islam. Yeah. But he also knew that our world of Islam had deviated. And by our coming to the Prophet, who was without blemish, but yet we had to come to him through those who represented him. And they didn't always represent him properly. So by keeping us from the old world of Islam and rearing us in this way, when we would come to the Prophet, we would come in a way that we would not allow the corruption of our world of Islam to influence our behavior. That's right. We, 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 I agree. No one would have any disagreement with that. He shared that with me before, too. Yes. It's the second time I'm hearing this from Minister Farquhar. He shared that with me before, and I appreciate it, because I, I, I didn't hear my father say that, but I know he said it, and I really appreciate my father telling the ministers that he wanted them to not to stay in the Bible like they were, he wanted them to go to the Quran. And no. lastly on this point, there's a picture of Master Farad Muhammad reading the Quran. Elijah Muhammad sitting in a chair and Waratuddin Muhammad with his hand on his father's shoulder mm -hmm. with the Quran in his hand. This is his assignment to preach the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is our assignment, whether we follow the Imam or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, to make the Qur'an our study. And the more we study the Qur'an, we will see what needs correction mm -hmm. in what Master Farad Muhammad left with us. Mm -hmm. And to all of the Muslims who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, if you remember in the lessons that Elijah Muhammad answered these questions and it said that these are very near correct. Mm -hmm. The question is, who will correct what was very near correct and make it fully correct without disavowing those that started us on this marvelous road mm -hmm. toward Islam? We will take a short break now. The American Muslim Hour will be right back with Imam W. Dean Muhammad and Minister Louis Farrakhan with Dr. Kaja. And 
now we will continue with our exclusive interview with Minister Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam, and Imam W.D. Muhammad, leader of the Muslim American Society. Now, uh, the other aspect of, uh, uh, of the teaching has been this whole idea of, uh, of, uh, of race relations, uh, meaning that the white man is a devil, uh, the original uh, superior man is, 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 a, is, is a black man. Uh, is that teaching still uh, a part of our teaching here? Or? <laughs> you should ask, are the actions <laughs> of white people that of the righteous? <laughs> the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told me in 1972 that he didn't want me to use that language anymore. He said, I want you to use the language Satan or Shaitan, the enemy, or the slave master's children. I didn't ask him why he didn't want me to use that language anymore, but that language had a purpose. Farad Muhammad, to me, was a master, not only for us, but for white people as well. Yeah. Because the sick thinking of white people that they are superior or supreme because of the color of their skin, that had to be defeated. Because once you think that you are superior and you act out that superiority on people that you feel are your inferior, you start offending the law of justice and freedom and equity, which puts you outside God's pale. So he, Farad Muhammad was making the white man to look into the mirror of his own actions as we called him a devil, and we did not slack in that. Malcolm was the number one preacher of that. Mm -hmm. But now, why did he tell me not to use that language anymore? It wasn't that white folk had necessarily changed, but that language had to give way to another language that would give us deeper thinking, mm -hmm. greater thinking. So any of us can be a devil if we choose to act out the wickedness mm -hmm. uh, rather than to submit to God. So race relations can best be served by preaching Islam. Yes, uh, but uh, by the same token, preaching Islam, which emphasizes the equality before the one God and does not distinguish between, uh, between colors or genders or races, why would uh, then the teaching emphasize that distinction? It was a medicine. I said. You were from Pakistan, right? You grew up under British rule. Yes, that's mm. correct. And as you grow up under British rule, they wanted you to believe that they were superior to you or to the people who were in India at that time. They preached a form of white supremacy in the way they handled their colonial subjects. Mm. So when Farad Muhammad taught us that the black man is the original man. He wasn't telling a lie. If our father is Adam, and he was fashioned out of black mud, and you look at the history of man on this earth, when they want to find the origin of man, they don't go to Europe. They go to Africa. So if the origin of man is from the black man, it doesn't necessarily make us superior, but it does make us the father. Since all came from Adam, and the Bible said from one blood came all nations, mm -hmm. Elijah Muhammad said, we are that one blood, and there's none of you as scientists or scholars can disprove that. He used that as a technique Right. to give us pride and love for ourselves, But at a certain point, medicine, if you take it beyond the point 
that it should, it be, becomes that which makes you sick. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to repeat what white people have done by thinking that we're superior because we're black. Because the prophet ended that. But I don't want Muslims either to say that Islam does not make distinctions. It doesn't make distinctions in superiority or inferiority, but Allah is he who created the hues. He doesn't want us not to recognize that we are of a different hue. So when the prophet saw that problem budding in the new community, it was he who said there's no superiority of the white over the black or the Arab over the non-Arab. What would make him say that, except that a kernel of racism was there in the Ummah then, and it is there in the Ummah today. Uh, so that kernel of racism needs to be uprooted and destroyed so that all of us as Muslims can see each other through the eyes of God. Uh, 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 in the interest of dialogue, as we would like to have dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, you left out part. He said there's no superiority of the white over the black, and there's no superiority of the black over the white. Mm -hmm. Then he went to the nation, national, nationalistic right. problem, the problem of the nationals. Then he said there's no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, and no superiority of a non-Arab over an Arab. Mm -hmm. And the best of you. Yes, and, and again, the Quran uh, has, has addressed that. Uh, the Quran says, yes. we have made you into nations and tribes so that you understand the differences between you. And that's where it rests. And then it also said that we created you out of one uh, pair. Yes. And uh, uh, so there is that whole notion within, uh, I mean, you know that as much as, uh, as I do and perhaps more. So my question is that from the main teachings now, as we are evolving, and under your leadership, people are learning. Uh, are we going to still keep that focus or that emphasis on, on, uh, on these, uh, uh, these divisions, especially now after 9-11? We uh, are different, and yet we are similar. Yes. Islam is what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. And the, the teachings of Islam and our practice of it will cause us to relate to each other as brothers. That's where we need to go today. Mm -hmm. and, and you think Good that... enough for me. <laughs> yes, and, and, and you rightly brought up the whole idea of the prevailing attitudes within the Ummah at large, away from here, uh, which needs certain examination or correction. Would you... Uh, uh, sort of laid out a little bit more to, as to what you expect of, uh, of the Muslim Ummah. Uh, it's not what I expect. It's what Allah and the Prophet, peace be upon him, expects of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to purify from those things that ill affect the Ummah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are those who have that mentality that they are superior. Yes. And there are those who feel that because this is a black person or an African, that they are less. And I saw it in the Muslim world. But why do you think that that feeling of superiority exists within these groups? I mean, what is your assessment? I think we live in the world ruled by shaitan. And shaitan will use the natural divisions and poison them so that human beings won't find the path of unity among themselves. People sometimes want to feel that they are better, but the prophet wanted us to feel that being better is being more in submission to the will of God. And if we raise that again, then maybe we can begin to expel this poison from the Ummah. The poison of nationalism has defeated what the Prophet wanted. One nation, no borders, no boundaries. But nationalism 
has made us to think more of our nation, its flag, its constitution, and the Quran is not the constitution mm -hmm. of most mm -hmm. of our Muslim nations. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of reform mm -hmm. that has to take place to bring us to where Allah wants us to go. Mm -hmm. And then I believe Allah will return us to that wonderful statement that you mentioned yesterday in your khutbah. I'll say it because I don't know the Arabic. You are the best nation mm -hmm. raised among men. Different for you enjoin us. good and you forbid evil. For you believe in Allah. Mm -hmm. That is where we need to go to mm -hmm. forbid the evil mm -hmm. that is going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. And the Muslim Ummah, mm -hmm. I believe, is the only power that can change what is going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, do you then think uh, that uh, there is indeed a need for, quote unquote, a reformation like Christianity went through in Islam? Yes, I do. And I believe it is happening. I know it is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, Muslims are not all uh, having a bad face in the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. You can go where the most trouble is and you will find sincere believers, just like it is in American society. Mm -hmm. Most American Americans who are, say they're Christians, they're not interested in projecting the Christian Christ, the Christ behavior and Christ nature to people. They drink, they party, they do a lot of things that show a different person, not the, the Christian that I see when I read the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same way for Muslims, regretfully, we have become like that too. Mm -hmm. Our public now does not project what is really Islam. Mm -hmm. But in that public, just as it is in our public here in America, among the Christians, there, there are Muslims in, in those publics mm -hmm. of those nations mm -hmm. that are very dissatisfied with what has been going on. And uh, there is a renewal and a revival going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, the nation of Islam has been a kind of uh, uh, strange uh, sign that has the power to heal many, mm -hmm. even though, as he says, there is prescription and there is poison in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you think that that process is, is, is going to happen here in, in America more readily than, than, uh, than, say, elsewhere in the Muslim country? It is I happening. Think so. It is yes. happening here more, more than it's happening elsewhere. Why, why, why would it be? Uh, well, in the end, we don't want to uh, uh, point to problems in, in the Islamic world. We didn't come here for that. But I have to say, uh, it's because we have more freedom of religion here even to be mm -hmm. Muslims. We have more freedom here than we have in many so-called Muslim nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, most of the Muslims that are in the United States from different parts of the Arab and Muslim world, sometimes they don't relate to each other on that side. Mm -hmm. But when they come here, because Islam is a minority and because there is some minor forms of persecution. Mm -hmm. When you open your masjid, you will find Pakistanis, you'll find Malaysians, you'll find people from Singapore and Africa. So we are forced by the American um, fabric mm -hmm. to be better toward each other because that's mm -hmm. what America represents. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, to me, that's the blessing mm -hmm. that America affords Muslims that we can be more brotherly toward each other under this, um, what do you call it, um, milieu, mm -hmm. under this social order mm -hmm. than we were in our own orders back home. Mm -hmm. Talking further a little bit about uh, relations uh, uh, with the non-Muslims, and first of all, going to 9-11, and examining that question, is, is there really now a clash of civilizations, as Huntington said, uh, or uh, there is an ongoing uh, feeling that indeed uh, it's Islam versus the best? How do you gentlemen see that? I think um, it doesn't have to be a clash of civilizations. 
there's much that our world can learn from the West. And there's much that the West can learn from Islam. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as President Khatami of Iran said, he didn't think that there should be a clash of civilizations. Unfortunately, though, you have persons in power that see Islam and its growth in America as a threat rather than a blessing. And so these persons in these positions of power, I believe, are fighting Islam. And what they're using the terrorism as the face or the mask to do other things that would destabilize Islam and curtail the rise of Islam in America and in the West. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you don't believe that there is a quote-unquote an attack on Islam because there is a, a feeling within the Muslim world that uh, I indeed this is an attack on, on Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, I, I agree, I agree, but at the same time, I don't believe that our government uh, wishes to attack Islam. Mm -hmm. But as Minister Farrakhan said, there are persons in the government who are against Islam. Uh, and they want to see Christianity grow and not have Islam growing next door you know, uh, in this country beside them. Mm -hmm. There are persons like that. Those persons could take advantage of situations like 9-11 mm -hmm. and do things mm -hmm. uh, and even maybe influence our government because mm -hmm. they're in there and they're very clever. Mm -hmm. They could perhaps even influence some members of the government. Even the President of the United States, yes. who knows? Yes. So in view of all the of this... The possibility, I'm agreeing with him, the possibility is there. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in view of all of this now, how do you foresee, especially you, Minister Farrakhan, the relationship, say, with, with the Jews and uh, uh, with, uh, with, with non-Muslims? You especially, I said, because uh, uh, with the Jews you... Uh, you have uh, raised a lot of questions in the Jewish press about your own comments in the past and whatnot. So, would you take that question? Yes. <laughs> um, maybe way back in the 50s, Imam Muhammad and I were talking, and he gave me a verse from the Quran. You may not remember this, but in this verse it says those who are Jews and those who are Sabians mm -hmm. those who believe and Sabians, yeah. in the last day they have their reward from their Lord mm -hmm. I don't wish for us as Muslims to be in a a fight with the people of the book but there are those among the people of the book who are not acting according to the statutes and commandments that they say they believe in in the book. Well, okay. the same as we, some of us within the Muslim world. It's, it's the same. Yes. But we are less in a position of power to influence mm -hmm. the cultural direction, the political direction, of this nation but some others are in that position and it is the misuse of that influence that today has me deeply concerned because I don't know any evil of Saddam Hussein that is not found in many leaders throughout the world mm -hmm. but it is not America's place to go into Iraq and set down a leader. That's for the Iraqi people to do. So when our government says, Colin Powell, before the Congress, we may have to go it alone. Go what alone? Go to Iraq and bomb them as you did Afghanistan? How could I, as a Muslim, go along with my government if they choose to do that to uh, Iraq. 
How could I join my government saying that Iran is a part of an axis of evil? I can't join that. I cannot let President Bush say those things and I not challenge him, regardless of the consequences, because I think America then becomes a criminal nation because the United Nations is not saying this. The United Nations did not set up a no-fly zone. Britain and America did that on their own. They've been bombing Iraq for the last 10 years at will. I am a Muslim, and I feel the pain of the Iraqi people. But America's obsession with Saddam Hussein is the basis for the pain that they are causing to an entire nation of people. And I don't think any sane thinking Muslim will back America if America wants to go into Iraq and send our soldiers, black, brown, and poor white, to lose their lives for somebody that has no power to hurt America and is not now doing anything against our nation. But, but you don't think that this is all a Jewish conspiracy? I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that. I don't think Mr. Bush is Jewish. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> no. I don't think Mr. Cheney is, is Jewish. But there's influence there. But when you start talking conspiracy, what my fear is that the government and the power of America will be used to destroy all the enemies of Israel. Because certainly none of these nations can offer America any harm. So to mention Syria, why would you bother Syria? You mention Libya, why would you bother Libya? You mention the Sudan, why would you bother the Sudan? What is it about the Sudan that you don't like? Is it America's right to send taxpayer dollars to destabilize governments that America does not like? This is wrong. Mm -hmm. And somebody has to speak against this. And if that is my lot, then I shall take that challenge. Do you have any comments on that, Imam uh, uh, Wallerstein? Uh, well, yes. Um, I, I was in uh, the Palestinian quarters uh, several years ago, and I saw conditions there, and the conditions are horrible. Um, and uh, I thought their punishment was extreme, too extreme. Uh, of the Palestinians, I thought their methods of containing them too horrible, inhuman, and too extreme. And we are happy when we see better leadership rise in Israel to work against that and work for peace, but we lost that. And now we have a, a, a government there that's hard, very hard. So I, I tend to not to want to say anything in the favor of Israel at mm -hmm. this particular time. And I appreciate this man for saying what he has said. May, no. I, may I say this yes. also, please, that this war on terrorism mm -hmm. has given many repressive governments, a shield. As the Imam has said, there are good Muslims all over this world that are trying to be better and to influence their governments mm -hmm. to be better. Maybe their methodology is not the best, mm -hmm. but they've called down on themselves the repression of the governments and police forces mm -hmm. of these Islamic nations. Mm -hmm. When I was in Syria with our dear uh, Sheikh, um, the Grand Mufti Kuftaro. of Syria, Kuftaro. 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 he and I went to see President Hafez al-Assad. Mm -hmm. Before President Hafez al-Assad passed, he told me, he asked the father, Bush, of our, our president. He asked him, 
define for me what is a terrorist and he said absent a definition and a standard by which you can judge the behavior of people then it's our terrorist is another man's freedom fighter who was Paul Revere was he a terrorist who was George Washington who were the minute men who were the people that sponsored the Boston Tea Party were they terrorists or were they sick of the oppression mm -hmm. from the crown of England mm -hmm. and does not God give us the right to stand up against oppression wherever that oppression may be he does and so does the Constitution of the United States of America and so in my humble opinion Poor Brother Arafat is in a very, very bad position because the Israeli government and the American government want him to rein in members of Hamas and Hezbollah, but they give him nothing. They don't say to President Arafat, we're going to stop building uh, new developments in the West Bank and we will stop our program of assassination if you go and rein in those suicide bombers. So what America and Israel wants Ar Arafat to do is to become the policeman to harm his own people who are fighting for better conditions for the Palestinians. But America will not rein in Israel. It is not an appropriate response for you to send F-16s that are made in America, mm -hmm. tanks that are made in America, rockets mm -hmm. that are made in America, and then deny the Palestinians even the right to get weapons so they can defend themselves. This is intolerable. And I believe, Brother Imam, that perhaps in America, we might be able to work a peaceful solution out with the Jewish community and send a signal to that troubled part of the world. And perhaps we need to encourage our government to be a better partner in the peace process than she is. So would you be willing to work with the, with the Jewish groups who are also seeking a just uh, solution? Of course. Of course. Peace there will give us peace here. Because if we don't work to end that crisis there, some of our children will be sent over there to fight and die on behalf of the United States. If a fair vote could be taken in Israel, I do believe that most of the Jewish citizens of Israel would be against the present government in Israel. And they would want it, that government removed. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. And the same thing here in America. I believe most of the Jews in America are, do not approve of that government that's in Israel right now. Now, uh, one last question to both of you and then we'll call it. Uh, we're all getting older now and we're all looking at this question of our own mortality. You have been sick. We've all prayed for your health. Thank you. As uh, you look back, on this whole, uh, on all these years of your leadership and your struggle, what do you think you could have done better? Well, hindsight, they say, is 2020 vision. I'm sure all of us who look back <laughs> can see things that we could have done better. But thanks be to Allah, we are alive today. Mm -hmm. So the things that we could have done better if we knew better, now that we know better, what are we going to do now <laughs> to prepare a future for our children and our grandchildren? I, I do believe there are many things that I could have done better, but I did according to what I knew, according to what I understood, 
according to what I believed. And I give my brother that same credit. He did according to what he knew, according to what he believed. Yeah. And now, here we are. Here we are. It doesn't mean that we still don't have areas of disagreement, but we're closer to each other now than we've ever been. Yeah. And we do not want this reversed mm -hmm. at all. We don't have to agree on everything. No, we don't. And we're Nobody different people. Does. We're different people. Allah gives us that right. That's Muhammad right. gave us that right mm -hmm. to have differences of opinion, to disagree. That's right. But, but, but not to become disagreeable. But if we agree on what what it takes to have unity for if all Muslims, there is no other problem. We agree on what we need to have all Muslims united, there's no more problems. And that's to believe in God, the one God who created the heavens and the earth and make no associates or partners with him. He has no sons, he has no wife, etc. This is Islam, okay? If we agree on that, then we agree that Muhammad, the prophet, Islam came to him by way of revelation, the Quran, and we did not have in the history of this world any Islam before that. So that's our leader. That's the leader of Islam. And in my opinion, as Kuftaro said, Mufti, Grand Mufti of Syria said, if you take all the bad out of the world and look at the good, and that's industry, technology, science, everything, Muhammad is the leader of even this modern world. Well, now, oh. if, I, if I might comment, you know, Islam was a progression. It's always been in the world, but not under that name, because all the prophets, we say, submission. they were Muslims. But the perfection of the religion yes. came with Prophet Muhammad. Yes. Peace be upon him. And he was the one who told us what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that final note, thank you very much, gentlemen, for, for being here, and uh, hopefully your uh, joint efforts will continue for the sake thank of you. Islam. It will. Thank you. We are brothers, thank you. and he's doing a beautiful job for the nation of Islam. Thank you.